Most people fall into the trap of thinking that their problems that are so big and huge, the solution has to be as equally big and huge. And I'm here to say that it's the exact opposite. Pick up a pen and paper and I can prove. We've done a good job of simplifying the conversation about how our language influences us for better and for worse. That's what I was so uh, attracted to was the simplicity of it. We got a glitch in our language, Cal. Most people, their language in certain ways is working against them unbeknownst to them. Trying to get through that when the, the drivers of that are specific memories that hold that emotional charge, like, like sonar buoys in the ocean just sending out this pulse of not good enough, not good enough. Those are the things that pull the emergency brake when people are looking to move forward in their life. It forces us to make victim-centric stories a lot of times unbeknownst to us. That's also great news because what that is, is is opportunity. What's mindset? Most of the time it's held in this big picture conversation. It's the story you tell yourself yourself. That's what your mindset is. It's the story you tell yourself about yourself and the place in the world and what you can do and what you can't do, what you deserve to have and what you don't deserve to have. There's certain words the victim mentality has to have. I want to know what those words are because the victim mentality is the mindset killer. It's the thief in the night. One of the things about the victim mentality is this idea that we're powerless and that we're just a participant in this experience. And I think when that shifts, you understand you have all the power, everything changes. England. Welcome to Austin. Thanks for having me, Cal. Yeah, via via our, our close friend, Dr. Nathan Riley. Correct, yes. I was sharing with you before we started here that your name has has somehow been in my orbit even before Dr. Nathan reached out. And then one of your enlifted coaches, Jen Ismar, who's a close friend from my, my days back in Chicago. And I couldn't remember like how I came across Cross your name, I started to do, you know, some of a little bit of research and very familiar with the program procabulary. I've, I've never done it, but I think that was part of it. And I think we're just in the same circles. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of common friends and um, common work that we're all doing. One of the things that I particularly love, and we're going to go obviously much deeper into this, but about the work you're doing, I've felt called in the last number of years to dig into the, the NLP work. And it's always just felt like a heavy lift. It's like you got to go somewhere for four days. You spend a lot of money. I've heard it's great. Uh, but when I, watched your uh, 90 minute Zoom you did with, um, what would you call it, with the Enlifted Coaches? Was it just kind of an introductory? We do one of those quarterly, open to the public, uh, Enlifted Essentials, Essentials in 90, that's what it's called. And it, it's the foundations of how to dismantle the victim mentality. And uh, yeah, we want me being me, the nature, and then the nurture, which a, a large part of that is what I was doing before I got into this line of work. I was an elementary school PE teacher. And uh, nice. so it's very simple. I'm a simple guy to the core. And um, we have, we've done a good job of simplifying the conversation about how our language influences us for better and for worse. That's it in a one liner. And then the rest is detail. And yeah, the, I think that's what I was so uh, attracted to was the simplicity of it. And, and again, my intention was to watch some of the Zoom to get a feel for it. And I ended up picking up the pen and paper and did the exercise along with the group. And I just don't, don't generally do that. I really don't. Thank you. Uh, and I think it was so easy and it was so... The invitation was, was so inviting is not the right word, but it, it, it uh, it's accessible. Yeah. That's what it was. And it's it was accessible. like, why wouldn't I do this? Like this is, and, and then the, what was shared, uh, a couple of people really opened up and I thought that was beautiful. And I, you could just see everything in them shift. Chubby's funeral. Yeah. Dude. 
right? Yeah, I've had people, I've had people, uh, and that was only a month ago that we did that, uh, that particular one. That was, uh, I think, the seventh, seventh one of those workshops that we've done. Uh, I've, I've had people like ask me about Chubby's funeral. They're like, bro, what happened after that? Um, yeah. You could hear a pin drop when he told that story. And having written it down for the first time. And that's a big part of the thing, you know, get, get, go in there and get the specific stories, title them and write them out conversationally. You, like, I would think most people would think that that's, well, I don't know if they would think that it, it, it would, it would seem that that would be a, an obvious thing to do. Yet most people do not do that. They're no. story hoarding. They can just keep the stories up here and that's hard work. That's tough action for someone who wants to move past how they've felt in the negative ways for most of their life. It's also tough action for coaches um, looking to facilitate transformation for their clients, dialoguing back and forth about how someone feels today in their adult life about a theme, generally speaking, trying to get through that when the, the drivers of that are specific memories that hold that emotional charge, like, like sonar buoys, in the, in the, in the ocean, just sending out this pulse of not good enough, not good enough. And that's, those are the things that, that pull the emergency break when people are looking to move forward in their life. Cause people know how that, what they want to do and how they want to feel in their, their adult world. And then why, why, why are things hard? Why do I keep talking myself out of things? You know, why do I feel like I don't belong here? Even though I'm here. Hmm. Mm. Weird. Oh yeah. <laughs> and everybody in that room is on some level, maybe feeling that. For sure. I had, uh, not that I needed it and tertiary confirmation. The first time it dropped on the, the, it, the penny dropped was, uh, I lived in London for the summer in 2011 and I happened to work with one person in, um, in, in the, the, the C-suite, we'll call it the C-suite. And, uh, word got out. She told all her friends and my roster filled up. I filled up with people in the C-suite for the entire summer. It was very interesting in London. And, um, when they opened up about how they felt they, they, they didn't belong there and some they, people they were going to get found out somehow, the imposter syndrome, yeah. the telephobia, the fear of not being good enough. Two days ago, I was talking to a Navy SEAL. And he said, yeah, that's really predominant in our, in our community. The fear of not being good enough, Navy SEALs, the fear of not, and here's the thing, it doesn't matter what people do, okay, what level they get to. We got a glitch in our language, Cal. And most people, uh, their language in certain ways is working against them unbeknownst to them. And this glitch, it, it scripts the victim mentality and all its 30, what Baskin Robbins got nothing. Oh, yeah, you nailed that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's like, absolutely. There's 131 flavors of <laughs> ouch and pain and sting and woe to the, the victim mentality. Yeah. And our language scripts, it, it forces us to make vic victim-centric stories um, a lot of times unbeknownst to us. And that's, that's, that's also great news because that's, what that is, is, is opportunity. Yeah. And this whole thing is, I come from an education background. I have a degree in education. Uh, it's, it's simply education. It's just simply some, some basic conversations about where to begin. And that's one of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here, the, you, did, I, as you just said, let me just hold this up for, for those who may be watching on YouTube. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, soft talk keywords. Uh, uh, is it okay if I read them out? Oh, I'd love it. Probably. Perhaps. Feels like, yes, maybe, could, might, possibly, sort of, kind of, potentially, hopefully try, one day, should, and almost like. It's almost like I'm procrastinating. I, I guess I'm avoiding the conversation. Maybe I'd get better results if I was more consistent. There's, it, it's known as verbal litter for a reason. It's wow. super sneaky. and um. And turns out it's the easiest place to start the conversation 
about how our words are influencing us for better and for worse. So it kind of cloaks the rest of the statement in a way, or how would you describe it? It, it, it radically, profoundly decreases my ability to make a decision. Keeps you stuck. Oh my gosh. In, in, the, in the sneakiest of ways. It's just this, these, these things that I keep on the end of the, just out of reach. Yeah. You know, I, I, I probably should spend more time with my wife. No, I know I need to. And if I use that probably, then I don't have to make a decision because I'm still thinking about the decision if I'm doing it or not. Uh-huh. And the thing it, it's, and yes, it's, this is easy to practice because you, you take out, you just take out the probabilities and the maybes and the guesses. And now you have a, a yes or a no. Um, the real work comes when you've, you, you force the issue with yourself. No, I, I need to spend more time with my wife. Okay. Am I going to, or am I not? And, and then it, it, it moves things forward. My favorite quote about soft talk. Um, I, I get the guy's name close to right. Mal, Malmodius. He said, I prefer the fear of making the wrong decision to the terror of indecision. And Ooh. these words are in people's language way more than they would think. I was at uh, Wednesday night, I was in San Antonio at Sweat Equity uh, doing a, a 90 minute workshop on this. We ended with soft talk. I gave the owner one of those plaques. Last night I was at um, CrossFit Central, Burnett Road, did a 60 minute workshop. We ended with soft talk, gave the two owners a plaque. And um, uh, uh, it's, it's, this is my 326 podcast that I've been on talking about this one thing. Shout out to Mike Bledsoe because he's a big part of the reason why we're here. And he <laughs> simultaneously, he's, he called me this. Was this back in the times. Barbell Shrug days? Or back bef- in the Barbell Shrug days. By the yeah. way, my very first podcast I ever went on was back in 2014. Nice. I was part of a uh, pro fitness league that started called the National Pro Grid League. And Mike and the guys were doing their podcast and, and they came to a couple of our different, uh, I think this one was our combines and were having, like I was a, a owner slash operator of one of the teams, the f- team in Phoenix. And I remember just going on there like, this is so fun and so cool. And just their vibe was oh, they're, they're, they're playful. And yeah, they had, they had all the stuff plus the X factor. Um, and he, he, so, oh, oh, I can do this fast. 2016, October, 2016, I reached out to five people in the CrossFit space. Who's got the best podcast in CrossFit? I didn't know. I'd done an on-ramp in 2015 at Paradiso CrossFit in Venice and, um, was there for the summer. And I'm like, these people are cool, man. They're, they're pack animals. They got each other's backs. They're doing, um, uh, uh, very, very interesting movements. And some of them are scary. So they've, you know, they, they've, they're adventurous. They know what they want. They have goals. And after 10 years of, so I've been doing this work for 16 years after that was after 10 years of doing a lot of work in different yoga communities, demonstrating very clearly that if we change some of the words and turn the volume down on the victim mentality, which I will recite very happily by definition, um, the breath unlocks. And then they get on the yoga mat and they're stretchier, they're bendier. And they really like that. I'm like, if we get this into, I can see this catching in CrossFit. And I, I was right. So they all came back, three, three gym owners, two, two regional games athletes. They, they, they all came back and said, Barbell Shrugged. And one of them said, oh, by the way, Mike Bledsoe is aware of your work. And I know someone who knows someone would you like an introduction? I said, yes, please. Two emails back and forth. We're on the calendar. So I fly from Thailand to do that show in Los Angeles, January 20th, 2017. Damn. Right. And when that show dropped, uh, we were on fumes in, uh, in the business as for, and we will paycheck to paycheck sure. in that way for two years since we incorporated and put the first course out procabulary. Um, we knew we had something. Just it's, you know, there, there's, there's having something and then there's getting it in front of people. Those are two different things. And, um, we went, when we went on that show and (laughs) there was, they had a five to one rule five and and Mike got to choose the one 
five guests in the fitness industry, very, you know, and then Mike got to, to pick one woo woo. No yes. shit. Yeah. And I was that, I was, that was yeah, yes. when that show dropped, <laughs> man, <laughs> when that show dropped, we got introduced to the fitness industry through Barbell Shrugged, who's the, they're the, they were the best mouthpiece at the time. And, um, and things changed and they've stayed, they have stayed changed. Um, 60% of our coaches are from the fitness industry in some form or fashion. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the four or five workshops that I'm doing on this tour are all in gyms, except for sweat equity. That's a, it's a cryo, uh, IV drip, uh, cold plunge, uh, sauna place. Very cool. Same, 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 you know, very similar, very similar veins. Um, and yeah, in soft talk, it's, it's, it's to finish that conversation or to put another piece of the puzzle in on soft talk. Um, when someone has those words in their language, they practice indecision, whether they want to or not, that's the thing. And if they do that for long enough, then they eventually identify themselves as indecisive. And once someone identifies themselves as something they get better at doing at, doing it for better or for worse. So I'm always late. Okay. When someone, when that story snaps into place and they identify themselves as always late, they get better at being late or I, I'm uh, great things happen when I show up. Um, when I, when I identify myself as a person who keeps showing up, I get better at showing up and I see, I, I see it's called the reticular activating system. It's the lens that I see thing, things through. And, um, our language is like a pair of binoculars. Our language is working those levers all the time. And, um, just a, a simple conversation about some things helps. Well, I love that too. The, the, uh, the example of always being late there, that, that is a, a story that, that I've, I think held on to for a while. And it's like, no matter how much, you know, I don't want to be late for some reason, I continue to show up late. And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with that, that plaque right there. And I'm curious as I dig into that, what that, how to kind of, uh, almost unplug that, you know, that programming that I've held on to for so long. The easiest way that I know to do that is, is to pick up a pen and a piece of paper and, uh, and get the stories generally, we can start generally and then eventually specifically written down, airing on the side of more detail than less. Cause then that gives you the opportunity to look at your words, which is very different than journaling. But when most people journal, they write whatever they write and they allow themselves to believe what's on paper, which is no different than the, the story that was in the head. I mean, fine. Yes, it's more organized and it's externalized to a degree. And if I allow myself to believe what's on paper, what have I done? Really? I've just really just reinforced the story that's bothering me in the first place. Now, the deal is to quote our man, Alan Watts, is to think about our thinking. He said, when you learn to think about your thinking, you become alive in a new way. And the best way I know to think about our thinking is to get the words on paper and look at them instead of believing them. Also known as slowing the story down. Fast stories, real hard to deal with, whether they're fast in our head or fast coming out of our mouth. Uh, very rarely does a mechanic take a car out to the interstate and run it at 85 miles an hour and pop the hood and start changing out parts. It's the same thing with our stories. Got to take this thing into the, into the garage and pop the hood and put it up on the rack and take a look. Well, I love that when we, when we had kind of gone through the process, the slowing the, the language down to 70% of normal pace. Yep. And then after each sentence, putting a slash, take a breath there. It's like really, it really just painted a completely different story. It does. And to make things even better, I don't have to know what the person needs to think or believe. I don't have to try and motivate them. I'm not into motivation. I'm not, I, or inspiration. I'll take it. I mean, it's superior to, 
uh, insecurity and apathy and resignation. And in comparison to curiosity and discipline, it ain't got nothing. Motivation's got nothing on curiosity and, and discipline. And I mean, this is first, first 10 minutes of the first class of our level one certification is, is the answers push, questions pull. And we're, we're great questions, coaches, just questions, questions, questions. That's part of it. And then helping the person get their story written down on paper. And it's, it's the mechanics of story. We're about the how or the mechanism. When the breath is trapped in the chest, stories kept in the head, very disorganized compared to once it's written down. Story in the head takes up a lot of space, uh, seemingly infinite. There, where, there's the worst part again, ouch. A uh, uh, story kept in the head. The story is still in me and I'm still in the story. It's subjective. Um, breath trapped in the chest. Pictures are up close, scary. And when we externalize it and read it and allow the emotions to happen and uh, slow the breath down, when someone slows down their read of the story, the breath loosens up. That's a big deal. And then that fourth step, there's only four, four steps. We get the breath in there between each sentence. As the breath descends back down into the abdomen, the picture moves out. And I, I, go, I go from the participant, relentless participant, to the observer. And in that process, I change my own perspective. I, as the coach, I don't have to change. I'm not, I'm not trying to figure out what they, their perspective needs to be. They're going to do it on their own, thank goodness. Because I don't want to know what people need to think. That's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, it's really weird. Yeah. I want to know what you need to think. Yeah. yeah. And then you need me. Well, I think, I think what was, was so appealing to me about that whole process and you said it a few times during the, the session, it's like not telling you to do anything. You're just opening a container for them to use their own words, their own story, their own language you're shifting a few things. You're omitting a few words. You're changing this from my story to his story. And then it, you, you include the breath. And as you said, you actually, you totally get to observe it objectively and say, well, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and then you can just hear it in everyone's voice as they're reading their, everything shifts in their energy around it. But I think, you know, my experience I did some, some kind of CrossFit coaching and lifestyle coaching as I came out of the trading world. And it was kind of this giving prescription. And uh, there's a, a place for that. Uh, for sure. But everything shifted for me when I allowed them to come to their own conclusions to really see what they needed to take my shit off them my like you know their success had anything to do with how i valued myself and allowed them to have their own experience and come to the oh this is what i need and we we know that when when it comes from within and really only when it comes from within that's the inspiration versus the motivation of like okay you can do this you got to go do this you got to go talk to that person you just need to believe in yourself more has anyone ever believed in themselves more because someone said you just need to believe <laughs> yeah. in yourself more? That's like telling your wife, you're overreacting. Oh, th thanks. I, I am. I didn't even, I didn't even know. Wow. It's, 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 it's funny. When you, it you is. Start to think about it. And it's, it's the same thing, but you know, answers, answers, push questions, pull answers. I tell them questions. They tell them. Yes. Those are two completely different universes for communication and coaching specifically, for sure. And um, being in all the right answers, 1-800-HOTLINE, I got all the right answers, coach, that's exhausting. It is. Because I got to know everything about everything. And if I don't, then what? where's my value? Uh, an imposter syndrome is just waiting to raise its hand and yell in my face. Because you're going to be results oriented. Did, did, did I quote unquote fix this person? And it's just not, it's not our job. But we, we unfortunately believe it is. And I think it's okay to be in that space to understand what it feels like to really be in that slog. 
And then to have an experience on the other side, it's like, oh, this is way easier, way That's lighter. The thing. This, it's way easier, way lighter. And, and there are a thousand percent. There are times when, uh, like if you're working on someone's back squat, tell them where to place their feet. Yes. You know, um, and things of that nature. And when it comes to helping people um, navigate through, say, a, the story of when their parents sat them down when they were nine and told them they were getting a divorce and their whole world went from flat to round and they assigned the meaning. Uh, uh, I got to be the man of the house now. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to, I got to shoulder this whole thing. And then they grow up and they, they play that pattern out. History doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes that whole thing. They play that out in their adult relationships and things get entangled and, weird codependencies get set up. It's just, yeah. So when it comes to something like that, um, you know, mindset, hey, let's do this too. I did this last night. I did the two, two nights ago. I'm doing it. Every, all the workshops. What is it? What is it? What's mindset? Mindset is a great thing to talk about. And most of the time it's held Cal in this big picture conversation. It's this thing we, no, we need to get better at, but how? And then there's that confident person over there. That looks fun. I'm over here. Whoops, would have been nice. When we add the part of the conversation about what words to use less of and why, if you want to stay focused on what's important to you, keep the drama down, extricate yourself out of gossip circles, build yourself, that's what a good thing to do, by the way, uh, build yourself up in your imagination, create feelings of confidence and competence and belonging and value. Um, when we add the conversation about the words in, now mindset becomes practical. I can practice thinking, speaking, and writing different and better. And then, and, 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 um, and then, you know, what is mindset? What is it? Most people that talk a lot about mindset, they don't have a practical, simple one-line definition of what it is, which is very valuable. We do. It's the story you tell yourself. That's what your mindset is. It's the story you tell yourself about yourself and the place in the world and what you can do and what you can't do, and what you deserve to have and what you don't deserve to have. It is a story. It's an ongoing story. We're participating. We're participating with our words. And when we learn more about how to pace our story, our rate of speech, where we're breathing when we make these noises that other people are hearing. Um, what words force me to create victim, villain, mental imagery, regardless of how I want to feel and live. Um, you know, then, then, well, most people's education about their language comes down to spelling, grammar, and definitions. Mm. Most people don't have any classes in high school about how to use their language and to, to breathe well. No. No. <laughs> and that is exactly what we do. We're known as the language people. Wonderful. It's great to be known as for something. Uh, and might as well be known as the language and the breathing people. And push comes to shove. It's about the breath. I'm there to unlock people's breath because they're going to make better choices they're going to have more fun. They're going to sleep better. They're going to poop better. They're going to smile more. They're going to laugh more. They're going to, uh, uh, it's going to be way harder to scare them. There's that whole thing. When they're breathing, when their breath is down low and slow in their, in, in their abdomen, in this parasympathetic nervous system response. And part of this whole thing is, and it is, it is our response to some of the stuff that we've briefly talked on, talked about. A lot of the guests that you come on are experts in these conversations and potential likely, very likely scenarios that are playing out geopolitically on the big picture. Yeah, there's, there's tremendous industry that's built off the back of the collective victim mentality of humanity. And that's mm. weird. That's also weird. Mm. And yeah. And um, Let, let's, let's dig into that a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts because I mean, and again, you're familiar with some of the, you know, the Dell big trees and the Mickey Willis's and, you know, I would say the, the people out there who are bucking the system and exposing for people who are curious, um, what, 
likely is going on and how they're, they're pitting one against another uh, under many different, uh, in many different areas. I'm not going to eat the bugs. <laughs> yes, Klaus. I'm not going to eat the bugs. Klaus, you eat the bugs. You drink the adrenochrome. I'm going to eat the steak and uh, dance with the women and have some fun. Right. Um, and yeah, I'm literate about Klaus and the World Economic Forum. And, um, and it started uh, with food. It started with food in 2003 when I went down to, so I, was, I, I lived in Thailand for 10 years. I was an elementary school sports teacher at an international school, great gig, for five years in Bangkok. And I had four months paid vacation every year. And a lot of that time, so I moved over to Thailand. I thought I was a tough guy. Uh, I wrestled in high school. Had, yeah, how the heck did you end up in Thailand? Yeah. It's, it's, and you traveled all over the world. So I'm cu so curious about that. We just touched on it yeah. before we got on, but like, how do you end up in that position in Thailand? I moved over there for a year for the Thai boxing. Okay. I had a, a job. Um, uh, my girlfriend and I from college, we went over there for a year. We we're going to uh, teach English as a second language. And that was a weird job. So anyway, we, I went over there for a year. The plan was to go over there for a year, practice up my Thai boxing skills, have this job, make some, you know, keep the lights on and then come back and go pro. Cause I'd wrestled in high school and had some pro uh, MMA, pro, pro MMA. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I remember, you know, I've, I've just been an observer of the sport that back in those early days, that was, it was a fair tech or what was the, Oh dude, I am the biggest fair tech goon. Ever. I've got it. Really I remember cool seeing videos like, so, oh, that's where you want to go to like, you got to get your Muay Thai in. And, oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. A thousand percent. Um, Fairtex is the only, so I've been kickboxing on and off for 26 years now. And um, that's the only equipment that I've, I've owned and they're cool. So when I was over, over there, my first year, I was, I, I taught five years at that international school, not the job we went over first, but a way better gig. And, um, I started this, the Klong toy sports program for kids. So Klong toy is the biggest slum in Bangkok. There's a hundred thousand people in a square kilometer. It's like the, like the corrugated shanty towns and the you know, it, it, it packed. And I'd go down there twice a week and I'd hold pads for some of the kids. It was super fun. Right. And I messaged fair text. I sent him an email. I said, Hey, I'm living in Bangkok. Um, I used to fight amateur and, uh, I, I love your gear. It's the only gear I've ever used. And I'm doing this thing, the sports program. Um, would you all be interested in sponsoring, um, this thing? And I got an email back the next day. They said, what do you want? And they sent me a, two huge boxes, $3,000 worth of brand new equipment. And at the same time, I'm living in the Japanese part of town. And I was going to this raw food restaurant because I'd gotten into uh, caring about what I eat uh, and organic stuff. And, um, and I kept going to this organic food restaurant, this raw food restaurant. And I'm in there one day and, and this little shelf over in the corner, they have these pamphlets for Fairtex, Fairtex camp, Muay Thai camp. This is like the last place you think these pamphlets would be. <laughs> yeah, and I go to the yeah. lady and the, I'm like, what's this? And they go, oh, Yui. And I'd met Yui. She owns it. It's like, that's her, her dad owns Fairtex. I'm like, what? And so Yui brought me out to meet her father. Uh, I had lunch with her father at the Fairtex factory because um, they were in textiles, which, and they had the camp, one of the camps there. They had a camp in Bangkok at the time. And this is before they opened up Padia. And there was, I, I had lunch with the most famous singer and pop singer and I didn't know, uh, her dad. And it, it was just, I, I brought my fair tech stuff with me. I got it. I got it in the apartment. No shit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and so I go down and I do this cleanse at this spa. It's a seven day program. You pay to not eat. It's a great business model. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Here's some money. Here's a lot of money. You get a coconut <laughs> <laughs> and don't be late to meditation. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And, um, 
and man, the place was popping at the time. It was, I, I, I got, I, I was, I was there in the, the apex of the scene. It was so fun. And so uh, everybody's talking about detoxing and healthy living, all these, all these things. And so I get some books to read and I go back and uh, this is 2003, 2004. Uh, uh, websites. I'd research organic food. And remember when they had the links over on the sides of the, to other, yeah. other websites. Uh, can we drop F-bombs? A hundred percent. No, wait, I just answered my own question. I've listened to some of your solo casts. <laughs> my man. Whoops. Even though we're practicing, I've, I left my rubber band at home. We're practicing um, uh, uh, no F-bombs February in the, the coaching community. Just to raise awareness about how much spicy language we're using. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to break my, yeah, uh, my F bomb fast, uh, over these websites about organic food and they'd have links over on the side and it said, fuck Monsanto. And I'm like, what's Monsanto? And so I'd read and I'd be like, oh my God, these people are, they might be insane. At the very least they're treacherous. And then on the Mon, like the, like the say no to Monsanto and GMO and, and all this on these websites, then it would have on the, or on the links, fuck the fuck vaccines. I'm like, I got some vaccines before I came over here before I wisened up. Uh, and so I clicked on that and I'm like, oh my God, all these class action lawsuits and all these weird things. And, and then, then over on the side of those websites, it was just this, this <laughs> thing that kept going over the rabbit hole. Oh, big time, dude. Um, for, for about four or five months, I wouldn't go out. I, I like people would want to go out. Girls would I'm like, I'm not going out. And, and, and then, and then it's like, um, chemtrails, like what's a chemtrail? Dude, I was on that, like uh, Clifford Carnicom, shout out to the Carnicom Institute. That was the first guy to put a chemtrail website up on in 1999. Cause he remembered what clouds looked like before they started spraying stuff. And he's a, um, uh, he's a, he, something just a beautiful, beautiful guy. And, um, and he, and he also tracked who, um, who was coming to his website and it was, it was all three letter agencies for the first year because the 1999, the web, the web, the web wasn't all that popular. That's right. And, um, yeah, so yeah, he paid attention. And then, and then on those chemtrail websites, it was fuck the Illuminati. Like, who's the Illuminati? <laughs> and then they have all these books. I read my first David Icke book. You ever heard of that guy? Oh, yeah. Read my first David Icke book. I haven't read of his books, but I've, I've seen a lot of his content. In 2006. And um, I've been tracking this thing since. Ooh. Yeah. And. <laughs> yeah. Way, <laughs> dude. Um, at the very least, it's entertaining. Yes. Um, and and to bring this back to the words and, and, and to, to make this even more of a grounded conversation, whether that stuff's real or not, I still piss myself off with my own words and blame other people. Mm. And that hurts. And that gets in the way of me doing my stuff. And in my, I am a, I, I believe I've said that I am a very simple person in my simple mind. The universe is a feedback system. And if seven, almost 8 billion people in some form or fashion are creating these victim centric, victim dynamic stories in their head, then the universe in all its wisdom feeds this thing back to us in a concrete experience. And so I don't think Klaus Schwab is going to repent. I don't think he's going to say, sorry. Um, <laughs> really don't. <laughs> uh, and, um, okay, well, if that's not going to happen, what happens when um, we unlock the collective breath of humanity? I mean, if we're going to have a goal, let's have a goal. Wh and, and how would we do that? Um, everybody starts practicing breath work. Uh, maybe. I doubt it. And please do. <laughs> we have a breath work coach in, in our community, Brandon Powell. He's a level three Wim Hof instructor second degree black belt in jujitsu. I was in a special ed class with him in the sixth grade. It was an entire year of the breakfast club, dude. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny in hindsight. Wow. And, and so we're huge on the breathing. And then 
how is what what's the best way to unlock the breath and and keep it unlocked in my opinion it's the words and and this dovetails nicely into the definition of the victim mentality most people have never heard the definition of the victim mentality uh since you're listening to this podcast i know you're listening uh get a pen and a piece of paper i'm going to do this twice write this down because if you write down the definition of the victim mentality you are now in an exclusive club i'll do this slow the first time speed it up the second time and add some context. Cool. Perfect. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. Most people have never heard the definition of the victim mentality. And I've been barking about this for 10 years. And I've seen a lot of light bulbs go off when people are like, oh, there's a name for this raging shit talking voice in my head. Cool. And there's words involved. Great. There's a game to play. I can play. I just don't have to be the, the, be on the, the, the sitting duck to this thing for the rest of my life while I try to, you know, live well, a little bit faster. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to tendency. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. They tend to regard themselves as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence. The second sentence is right between the eyes, right where it belongs. The victim mentality depends as in it has to have a habitual thought process and attributions. It has to have a habitual thought process. Habitual accurately implies duration and addiction. And so simple, simple guy over here. So if there's a thought process also known as certain words put together in certain ways, repeated over time, there, there's certain words the victim mentality has to have. What are those words? I want to know what those words are. Because the victim mentality is the mindset killer. It's the thief in the night. That's take it or leave it. That's my personal professional opinion. Uh, uh, and it's, it's the bottom is endless. And it wants you, it wants all your friends too. <laughs> like that. It wants to light your community on fire. Yeah. And it's good at it. Yeah. It's the most sneaky to crack cocaine and got shit on the victim mentality. Because it's, it's what's more seductive than our own voice in our own head. Oh, of course it's, of course I got it right the first time. I haven't even write, don't need to write it down. It's my own voice in my own head. Let's go with it. Yeah. We'll do it in, in, in. Which- I, I do this stuff because I don't want my nieces and nephews. And if, if kids, if I ever choose to engineer people, I'm not going to have kids like you have a cold or have a, have a dessert. I'm going to create some cool people. I'm going to engineer some cool people. If I ever choose to do that, they're not going to eat the bugs. They're not going to eat the bugs. This is how I'm, this is my little thing to say no to that. Um, and you know, I don't, here it is in a nutshell. Also with the, you know, the Klaus thing and humanity plus technology plus the victim mentality equals the Borg. Mm. Remember the Borg from, some, from Star Trek? Half man, half machine. Ooh, yeah. Uh, hive, hive community, hive civilization. There's no tan. Nobody's dancing. Nobody's smiling. I doubt they're reproducing naturally. No free thought. That's called transhumanism. Humanity plus technology, plus the architect mentality or the hero mentality equals Star Trek. Mm. They're out there cruising around. I mean, technology is here to stay unless, you know, meteor blasts us off the face of the earth right. or like a, like a global, e- the sun farts, something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah. Um, technology is here to stay and, and we, we could do Star Trek. We could be zipping around and having adventures and People are laughing and, you know, we've retained our soul. Transhumanism wants that. Why do they want that? What, what would want that? It's 
It's weird. It is. And I mean, if what a story to be, we're in this thing. Yeah, we're well, in this story. What, that's what I kind of keep reminding myself when, when it does feel a little bit heavy. And it's like, we kind of, we chose to be here. Yeah. And these are fascinating times and it can go any direction. What can I do to. You're doing a tremendous amount, mm. uh, a tremendous amount. And, and our man Buckminster Fuller, he said, it'll be a neck and neck race to the very. It feels like it. I know, right? I know, right? And here's the thing. Um, I had a, a, a training that I was going to be participating in, in outside of San Antonio um, this coming weekend. And it got moved. And I had these, these, these dates on the calendar scheduled. And I said, I'm going. I'm going, I'm, go I'm still going before I had anything lined up. This was not a work trip. This was not a work trip. And, um, it's sometimes folks, you want to go on the offensive. Okay. What does that mean? Picking up a pitchfork? No, no, just go do your stuff, put it out there. And, um, because I, I only know what happens if I don't go. I know what happens if I sit down and stay there. I don't know what happens if I show up and it's always better than what I could have possibly imagined. If I do be, this is fantastic. Like I, this is better than I could have imagined hanging out with you and seeing the, and, and, um, the house. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Oh dude. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. It's, we it's, decided it's, it's fun. It's fun. Um, and at I like being in the arena. I like being in the arena. I'm not afraid to get my ass kicked. I've had my ass kicked. I've been beat, beat up, knocked out. Um, uh, what were one of those times when you just didn't see it coming? You kind of waltzing in. You're like, okay, we got this. And it's like, whoa, okay. I've got something to learn about that. I picked one fight. I started one fight in my life. And, and um, I got beat up by three dudes. Yeah. Where were you? Radford University. And we were at the, um, we were down at the bar and um, these dudes were talking trash from a fight that had happened a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, I knocked back a few shots of Jägermeister and I just left my friends. And I went to where I knew they were. And I just walked up and started running my mouth and the biggest one clobbered me in the back of the head and I come to wrestling this other guy and I wake, I like, I just had flat, I had like brief flashes of the, of, of the, the, the beating. And I woke up with cuts and bruises all over my face, face down, shoes on in my bed. It was the only time I've ever started a fight. And, uh, I remembered that sometimes you need to get your ass kicked, you know? This is a whole online trash talking thing. There's very little repercussion for people's words these days. And, um, my, my, my father, his, his whole, there were, there were hillbillies, man, coal mining hillbillies from the mountains of Virginia, deep Appalachia. And it's me there's one story of when he was a kid, one, it was like our uncle, great uncle he used to carry a hawk bill knife. His nickname was Hawk Bill and he had beef with this other dude in town and they agreed never to speak ever again. And they passed each other on the street and one of them said something and they homeboy pulls out his, his Hawk Bill knife. The other guy pulls out a pistol. They start wrestling. One of them gets it through the neck. She gets shot through the neck. Um, the other one gets shot through the leg and, um, and, and the police show up and take them to the hospital and drop them off. And that was it. I mean, one guy lost his leg, but like, there was no charges. I had a guy ask me to step outside at IHOP one, one time at, uh, cause his friend and my girlfriend were arguing in the, uh, uh, at the counter about who was first. And I was watching through the glass and I'm just like, what's going on? And, um, this guy's friend came out and we just, we lock eyes and he goes, Hey man, you want to you step outside? I just thought to myself, thank Jesus. Yes. And I stood up and threw my wallet to my friend, walked out. He turned around and we were in each other's face for a second. I blasted him right in the face. 
smushed his nose real good. And he pressed charges. That wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. You, you, something comes out of your mouth, you deal with it. Like you got to own that. And today <laughs> I, I could only imagine what it's like growing up with phones and social media and every single thing is recorded. Like those street fighting days, those are over. You yeah. Know? It's actually even worse. It's more like you just start shooting. So, you know, different times. Yeah. Big time. I wasn't expecting to talk about fist fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know. One of the things about the victim mentality, you know, that I've, I've wrestled with and, and, and I think you really, you hit the nail on the head is like, there's this idea that we're powerless and that we're just a participant in this experience. And I think when that shifts and you understand you have all the power, everything changes. And I think it's, it's very easy to be comfortable in the incoming of the victim mentality. It's, there's no accountability. There's no self-responsibility. It's all just like, woe is me. I got a fucking dealt a bad hand and people just get stuck in it. And to make matters worse, it's celebrated. Oh yeah. It's the victim Olympics right now. Oh wow. Yeah. You know, who's got the oh, most. Oh fuck dude. Yes. <laughs> it's. Who, who's got the most downtrodden story wins. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, to put it in, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to do this. Either I'm going to do this or there'll be a plat cataclysm or something. I'm going to make relentlessly playing the victim approximately as cool as littering. I'm going to do this for 50 years, dude. I love it. It's either like, it's in my calendar. I was a horrible student. Just horrible. I wasn't disruptive. I was destructive. Mm. One, you know, call me old fashioned. Kids shouldn't sit that long. You shouldn't sit there that much. It's not normal. It's weird. And, and then here's a bunch of, did, were you really thrilled? Who was, who was really thrilled with in the public school curriculum? Like enthralled, like, wow, this is really gonna help me live a baller life. And, and so I was just super bored and I walked out of there thinking, man, I'm a dummy. I'm a dummy. I'm surprised I even got out. Um, and when, when you know, I've, I've fallen in love twice on site, There's a couple of women, it's a side conversation, but the first time I ever got choked in jujitsu, I wrestled in high school and that was cool. I pin you, you pin me. But the first time I went to a jujitsu class, I got choked. I was like, oh, I gotta learn this. And the second time I fell in love on site was when I saw, uh, uh, I went to an emotional detoxification seminar workshop in 2003 at that same spa. I've told this story a lot. I'm still telling it. And the guy, Barry Musgrave, um, turned into my first mentor. I, unbeknownst to me at the time, this guy was going to play a profound role in my life. And he talked about words and stories and identity and breath. And then he asked, um, is anybody, anybody stuck on a story? And this one woman shot her hand up. And she, it, was a, <laughs> it was a painful breakup. It was or a, a humiliating short story. Her and her friends got a house down at the beach for beach week. Her boyfriend and his friends got a house next door Add alcohol, press play, right? He hooks up with her best friend in front of everybody one night and then dumps her in front of everybody the next night. Ouchie. And four years, she hadn't gotten in a relationship because she was still steaming on this thing. And he had her tell the story three times. First time, he didn't touch any of the words. Just let it happen. And she's crying and angry. Second time through, he starts adjusting the words. And you can see the thing starting to loosen up. And now she's sad, no tears. Third time through, he stopped the story at the linchpin sentence. He knew what he was doing. Say that again. He did that to me. That was the Lord of the Rings sentence. That was the thing that was holding the whole thing together, right? Mm. Right, right. <laughs> he did that to me. 
And he had it, I'm going to say it three times. So everybody's staring at the same spell. The definition of a spell, Webster is not mine, is a word or a combination of words of great influence. And he did that to me is a combination of words that was greatly influencing her. No one will ever really love me as a combination of words that if someone believes will greatly influence them. You know, I'm supported is a combination of words. It goes both ways that if someone believes will greatly influence them. Okay. Is there constrictive spells and expansive spells? And since we've talked about some weird stuff already, Rudolf Steiner said any force that seeks to constrict or control is by definition Luciferian. So we're in the Luciferian spell breaking business Hmm. by definition. Mm -hmm. And he did that to me. He had her take out that last word, me, and put in himself. And it was such a radical departure from the story that she'd been relentlessly telling herself since it happened. It was, it was clunky and it went up at the end. It's called up talk. It means it's a question. He, he, he did that to himself. And then you see it catch in the breath releases. <sighs> he did. He did do that to himself. And she's looking all over the different places, but she's internal looking at different evidence now. Cause she can see different, she can see different things, reticular activating system. We can talk about this in a second. And then, and then she starts talking about, oh, he lost friends and all these things happened to him. And then finally she goes, that guy was really weird. It was never going to work out anyway. <laughs> so good. Walked herself right out of that thing. And I was like, I was like that. Cause I had a, he did that to me story. She shouldn't have been kicking that hard. We were just warming up. That was one of them. And then the other one was, I, I tapped. Guy had me in a knee bar. I tapped. This is, this is, a, and pops a meniscus in my, on the outside of my left knee, which I was like, yeah, fine. I'll get it scoped again. And when the doctor said, your career as a fighter is over. I pictured, I was 27 years old. I just moved over there six months in. This was the biggest move, cow by a order of magnitude in my life. I'd only had my passport for two years. And I moved over to Thailand for a year to really go for it. I had three going away parties. And, and then, so now this is, this is now the final piece of evidence in the case that I was secretly making against myself that I'm not good enough. Now you have the final proof, bro. Case closed. You're, you're convicted. Convictions, very convicted sentences, mental prison sentences. Oh yeah. And I entrenched a, and he told your, your career as a fighter is over. You could become a very good swimmer. I pictured me swimming laps next to grandma and I'm like, that ain't it. Yeah. And so the Vic darkness descended. Uh, I turned into a grown ass man, baby. That's a technical term. <laughs> and I didn't laugh for an entire year. And eventually I was like, dude, are you going to be complaining about this when you're 55? Cause if you do, then you really are the loser that you scared you are. You got to go do something different. And then the spa presented itself. I was like, yes, I'll go pay a thousand dollars for a coconut. Glad I did. I kept going. And eventually, um, January 17th, 2007, um, because of the studying that I had done since that emotional detox workshop, I kept going back down there and befriended. I was in the community. Now I put my poster, I went pro that day. I've been pro since doing one thing. One thing, Mike Bledsoe, he, he called me numerous times. He called me a one trick pony. He still will. Cause I want him to. Yeah. And simultaneously I'm in his phone as spec ops. Mm. I just said, you got, you got a story thing to do. You get, you want to, you know, have a conversation about the words. Let's go. Everything else. Other people, plenty other people. Dude. And that's such a beautiful origin story. It's like that thing that moved you so much. That like, this is what I need to do seeing what the worst case scenario outcome was, oh, was extremely motivating. You don't want to stare at that the whole time, but you do want to know what, what lies around the bend over the hills and far away, or at least take a guess. And if your breath is locked in your chest and you got all the, take, take the world economic, take, take Davos out, take, Bilderberger group out. Take the Illuminati out. Take the, take the Jesuits out, whoever. 
take Jeffrey Epstein and his client list out of the thing. Most people aren't operating at that level. It's, the, it's their neighbor. It's a person that they just got out of a relationship with. It's their mom. Mom, mom always talks to me like a child. Look at the words. Mom always treats me like a child. What's that going to do for me and Einstein? Because two plus two equals four. Mom's in the picture. I'm in the picture. She's doing that to me. I'm on the receiving end. That's stressful. Take out mom, put in I. Shits and giggles. See what happens. I, I treat me like a child. Who treat, who's talked more shit about me than me? Mm. That's a real question. Yeah. Wow. Who's, who's talked more trash about Mark England than Mark England? There's not a close second. Yeah. And that, after the <laughs> infuriating nature of the answer of that question uh, passes, it's good news because I can do something about that. I can totally do something about that. It turns out, hearty har har, you know, you treat yourself well and like an adult and you be your own hype man and mom might even go one day, hmm, good job. But even if she says that, until I've done that for me, I mean, it might feel good in the moment. It'll be fleeting. Yeah, it gets, it gets put through that lens again. For sure. Which now she's, she's, she's praising me like a little child. Pat you on the top of the head. You, one of the things that I, I loved and it's like it, just such a simple practice and uh, you, you went much deeper kind of throughout the, the session the other day, but just the idea of the should, the could, and the can. And I went through that myself and I was like, ugh. for me, it was the example, you know, yeah, I think you, you invited everyone to come up with a should statement. So for me, it was like, I had just gotten this float tank. Put a while, it took a while to put it together. I was really excited about it. I'm excited for, for a while. And it had been about four or five days and I hadn't floated yet. I really should use the float tank. You put a really in there. It's, you, it's just, you get even more <laughs> pressure and obligation, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I mean, who, who really likes running their day off pressure and obligation? <laughs> yeah. So then it was, it was the, 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 the ideas change should to could. Okay. Really. And I'll, I'll drop the, maybe I'll drop the really nice. I could use the float tank. Ooh, that's cool. That's an invitation. Didn't have the density of like, I should, the, the obligation, the not meeting the obligation, all the me not showing up. And then the, the, the final was. I can use the float tank. And that night I fucking used the float tank. My man. That's that called it. the art and science of talking yourself into the good stuff. Most people are talking themselves out of the, the good stuff. And the question is not why. Why do I always talk myself out of opportunity? It's how, how am I talking myself out of Oof, opportunity? Yeah. We had a, um, we had a guy uh, two nights ago we ran the should detox. That's what that is. It's should detox. We've got 320 coaches and we polled them. What's your favorite language game? Cause we've got a whole ton of language games. Cause guess what? People like playing games. Okay. And when someone's having fun changing their story, they're likely to continue practice, practicing, changing and improving their story. And by far it was the should detox. And we did this two nights ago in San Antonio at sweat equity. Shout out to Heather O'Neill and her son. Um, I, I, I should eat healthier. How's that feel to say? It, real, real complicated. Total rocket science. Write down a should statement, read it, and observe the feeling. He's like, oh, I got this thing in my shell. Great. Take out the should, put in could. Hmm. He made the noise. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I could eat healthier. Better? Yeah, better. They got the could put in can. I can eat healthier. Yeah, I can. Great. Stick a because on the end of that thing and fill in the rest. It was really cool. I can eat healthier because I'm competing in three jujitsu tournaments this year and I want to medal. Now he's got the why. 
when it doesn't matter what the why is, when someone puts a why on the end of anything, they get a 33% boost in, 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 in yes. And then I was like, okay, cool. Um, after healthier put this week, put in this week, I can eat healthier this week. So now he's zooming in on the thing. Mm. Okay. Making it actionable because it's actually a faux positive. I, I, I can eat healthier in my imagination. That looks good. And, um, it's, it's, it's just indefinite. Yeah. And if you knock out a week, what are you likely to do? Keep going. Cause you got some momentum. Okay. So that's the art and science also of, of, of using our language to turn a mountain into a molehill. And, and most people fall into the trap of thinking that there are problems that are so big and huge. The solution has to be as equally big and huge. And I'm here to say that it's the exact opposite. Pick up a pen and paper and I can prove it. And if we further zoom out, Klaus isn't going to say sorry. Klaus isn't going to say sorry. What am I going to do? I'm coming down to Texas. I'm going to drive down to Texas, splash around in the hot springs on my way down here, and then do a bunch of workshops and meet people and go on podcasts and, 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 and see what happens. Because like I said, I'm curious. And I do. I'm disciplined with this. I've been, I've been doing this 16 years. After 10 years in, Cal, I was like, I have no more questions. Because I wake up every day and I'm, I have a full tank of gas for this. Um, it's a gift. Uh, you can't choose your attractions. Okay? You, can't, you can't talk yourself into being attracted to something or someone or vice versa. It just doesn't work like that. Pay attention to what you pay attention to, folks. Pay attention to what your, your interests are. And after 10 years of, of doing this full time, I go, I commit to 50. And I went into my calendar. It took me a while to get down there. Yeah. <laughs> January 17th, 2057 is my last day. I don't know what I'm going to do. It could be a work meeting. It could be a session. It could be a podcast. It could be a workshop. It could be who knows who cares. Because I want to know what it feels like to do this thing for 50 years. And I'll have said everything I can think to say. And on January 18th, 2057, I'm never talking about this shit again. Damn. And I actually look forward to that. Yeah. Well, let's zoom in a little bit. What's a, day, what's a, what's the, what's a, you know, let's take it from 50 years down to a day. What's like a, a daily practice. What's a common day in your life? Maybe when you're not traveling or what's that look like? How do, how do people, you know, really fold these things into their, into their everyday life? Um, as far as the words are concerned, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a broken record over here. Uh, soft talk. Here, okay, let's do this. Go to enlifted.me backslash, I say that right, backslash soft talk. And you'll get the downloadable, so the, we, we brought a thousand um, PDFs, P, printouts of, of that. Perfect. Um, and we're handing those out to everybody. And we tell them, take this piece of paper and stick it up somewhere for 30 days. So where you see it once a day and watch what happens, what will inevitably happen. And it, it's free. It's, it's, um, and it is, it's the gateway drug to the rest of your language. You start making some connections about that. And then you practice thinking about your thinking and then, and then, then, and then you're in the arena and the game just it goes on its own. Take that piece of paper, put it up somewhere where you're going to see it for 30 days. And, uh, uh, first things first, it will raise your awareness about these words. And then you'll start plucking them out of your emails and your texts. Cause that's where you'll see it first. Cause you got the lag time and your email exchanges will get clearer and faster. And my, we've done more trainings in organizations and groups than I can count. And, uh, inevitably everybody says, our communication has streamlined and gotten more harmonious and uh, productive. And, and they're saying that, well, that's, it's happening in my personal life too. Because guess what? The soft talk in your professional life is creating the same kind of anxiety and indecision and um, fear of, of taking a strong position on something. If I play small to protect somebody else's smallness, we both lose. 
And at some, by, at some point in time, people have got to, somebody's got to say, we're doing this and this is how we're going to do it. It's really hard to lead. It's really hard to lead with those words. Yeah. Super hard. Oh it's, yeah. It's super that's... hard to motivate. It's super, well, it's oh, yeah. about that's it's, so funny. It's, I'm just looking at it. Oh, just like it's, standing yes. up in front of a group, <laughs> trying Brutal. to really just inspire them. What we did with the, on all the workshops, almost all the workshops, we end with soft talk and we end with something called soft goals. All right, everybody, get your pen and write down the most important goal for you in 2023 in one sentence. And people pick things that are important to them. Um, I want to double my income in 2023, or I want to run that race in 2023, or I want to enroll 300 people into my program in 2023. And I have them write it, I have them read it, and then I ask them how that feels, and they inevitably say, "Oh, good," or you know, "It's ooh, it's exciting," or, a little bit, a little bit scary. Great. And then I'm like, okay, take the word maybe and stick it anywhere in that sentence. My God, does it prove a point? Ooh. Right? Yeah. I maybe want to enroll 300 <laughs> people in my program for 2023. <laughs> and they're like, I don't want to say it. I'm like, I know and say it just so, so you feel it. That's the thing. When people feel, when they feel it, they know it. And um, so, that's, that's one of the practices. That's a great that practice. It's so simple it's and it's a, free. It just shows you the shift of like the common, how we commonly insert the soft talk language into everything without, it, you know, realizing it. And it causes a lot of problems. Yeah. It causes a tremendous amount of problems. Um, and, and, and walking, you know, what is a, what was one of my daily practices? Uh, I walk a lot. Um, and I first clocked it. So we have, we have three, three levels of certification and a specialty course. It's called Enlifted Ancestors. It's going, one of them is going on right now. We do it once a year and we go into the family story. Right? It's, yeah, it's, it gets real. And what do the three levels look like? Level one is all it's, it's dedicated specifically to dismantling the victim mentality because that's where most coaches are going to meet their clients in the stuck and suck. Rarely does a coach, rarely does someone book in for a coach uh, when the sun's out, when things are good. No, they're stuck somewhere. They're struggling somewhere that they need some help. And upon further inspection of the words, there's more there than they likely have thought. Great. And there's an art and a science to it. Is that a, a cohort that goes through or is it the type of thing you go at your own pace? Oh, it's instructor led me. I deliver all the trainings. Oh, great. Yeah. I deliver all the trainings. They're virtual and they're live and there's 10 people at a time. We could scale the crap out of this thing and we're not, we've got an online course and then there's an app in the app store and beta and those things are scalable, of course. And as far as the coaches, no, because this is an art, this is a craft, this is a practice and, and, and a path. And it is very, very uh, intimate. The first month sucks. It just sucks because we go in there. I tell them like this, this is going to be an extremely heavy lift for a lot of you because I'm ruthless with the questions. Um, and everybody knows that going in. There's no surprises in the, in the, in the general sense that, oh, uh, I'm going to feel some things that uh, hurt. Great. It's called transformation. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's how the, the story game is played. It's the st stories of ouch and pain and stinging woe are like a spicy Thai dish. They burn going in, they smolder while they're in there and they burn coming out. Mm. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> go, go get the hottest thing, Thai hot on the menu and message me in 48 hours. If everything is assuming everything is moving, working correctly. And most people are doing their very best to avoid that, the, 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 it burn, the burn coming out. And so, um, the tools that we teach you, we, they're applied as they go through. So it's equal parts, personal, professional development. Level two is, so that's the cleanup. Level two is the party. And if we can sum it up in one thing, it's getting good being seen because most people are not good being seen. Okay. This is, this is taking, this is trying to avoid taking a compliment on steroids and acid. And, um, and, and part of that, the sec, so the, it's, it's, what do you do with your clients once you get them unstuck? It's called celebrating wins. 
Goal setting is in the middle and then presentation skills and how to run in lifted workshops is the second part. We're not running a level three this year because um, we have a, uh, some, some curriculum. We have to shoot another course in order to implement that. Um, and Ancestors is, it, it's family constellations on a Google Doc, if you're familiar with that. That's what that guy, Barry Musgrave, um, that's what he went on to dig it, get into big time, family constellations. And unbeknownst to me, I just wanted to go and, and see and hang out and do some work on my, uh, I didn't know I'd be eventually teaching a course, um, courses in, in our version of that, using questions and getting the story, the story, write out the, the story of your, your mother's childhood and four step it. Same thing with your father, same thing with your grandfather. And then you got a list of questions. Were there any murders in the family? Were there any wrong business dealings? Were there any um, uh, uh, abandoned children, any mental illness, any, any, any immigrate war? All, all the stuff that gets like, let's not talk about that. Sweep that under the rug. Get that out on paper. The, 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 the gods shine down on thee for doing that. Um, man, I'm on a rant and tangent about that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, this, this is... Like I said, it's an art, it's a craft. We spend a tremendous amount of time with our coaches. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then you have the lifted podcast. Yeah. Yeah, we do. So I'm just trying to, you know, just for people to like, what are the different touch points where sure. they can, you know, I had sure. the one experience of watching the recording um, of the in lifted essentials. It's like, whoa, that was remarkable. Yes, we, um, we're open source with our coaching technology for a couple of reasons. One, we're teachers to the core. If someone wants to get certified, come on in. You're going to get way more than you were expecting, okay? And the community. Um, and if someone wants to learn what we're doing uh, on, without doing the search, we're going to put it out there. We're going to teach you. So we're, we're teachers. And then we're also very confident with our coaching technology. Here's, here's what we're doing. Okay. Here's here, take a look at it. I'll I'll put what I'll put the enlifted method up against anything out there in its simplicity and its effectiveness. Okay, because it's simple and it's effective, and anybody can use it. Like Doctor Simple over here. I didn't need a PhD to create the story of not being good enough when I was eight, and I don't need a PhD to change the story of not being good enough that I made when I was eight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, of, of course, there's times for the, the credentialed professionals. Mm -hmm. I'm not that mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a simple man of mediocre intelligence with a handful of MMA fights that used to teach elementary school kids how to throw dodgeballs. Mm -hmm. like, that's who you're listening to. So take that, take what I say with a grain of salt. <laughs> and I'm also a nerd with this stuff. I've just been staring at it for, since I saw it the first time. And, and I will continue to do so till I'm finished. Um, we, yeah, we have a podcast, the Getting Lifted podcast. It's fun. It's all about the words. Uh, it's a lot for, uh, it's, it's all of our coaches. Um, well, not all of them. The, the Kimberly Kesting, she's the host. Chopper Dave Robinson, Chase Tollison, two of our level three coaches. They're the co-hosts. We bring coaches on and talk about um, story and words. And, a lot of coaches listen to our podcast and, and also a lot of people that um, find they're not coaches, but they have kids. That means you're a coach mm. <laughs> or people that just want to learn more about their, um, their words and stories. Uh, yeah. And then we're on Instagram at and lifted coaches. We post some fun stuff there. Well, and I think just like, um, Normal, normal, normal touch. Point. Couple stuff, you know, you, you, whether it's married or dating or whatever, there's probably heavier when you're married because you're in, you have some entrenched language there, but there's, do you specifically work with couples or is it something that's just open for couples or one of the partners to come in and, and, and take the classes? What does that look like? That kind of coaching? Uh, most of the time it's, it's individuals. Um, uh, we've had seven couples take the level one together. 
and we have a we have a a, a special conversation with them is because we're not modifying the curriculum to walk around anyone's stories. Like I ask the same questions direct, uh, whether you're married or not. So you listen, you're going to air some dirty laundry in this, in in front of this person, play at your own level. And, um, this is likely going to be some stuff that you haven't heard from that other person. The last two people that went through it are Steve and Leanne Knox from, um, Queensland, Australia, they knew they could, we, we want people to know what they're getting into. It's not that we want to, they, they should. Okay. Um, which is one of the reasons why I put the, the 90 minute workshop out. That's very, that's, that's what people learn to do in level one is facilitate like that. And that's the level of the games, the, 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 the depth that we play. Okay. A lot of times it starts with something that's going on in someone's adult life and it goes back, it goes back there. Chubby's funeral. Yeah. That's Chubby's funeral. Chubby's funeral. Yeah. I did never written that story down. Yeah. And until that story is him getting an, another CrossFit certification was not going to get that story taken care of. Him going from a, a six pack to an eight pack was not going to get that story taken care of. Him recommitting to his paleo diet was not going to get that story taken care of. What gets that story taken care of is a tool that's specifically designed to take care of stories like that. That's what we do. We're very niche. Some, some of our coaches, they coach exclusively with the enlifted method. Most of them plug it into what they're already doing. And that's super cool to see. We've got, we've got a ton of nutrition coaches. 60% of our coaches are from the fitness industry. Um, we have uh, men's coaches. We have women's coaches. We have uh, a, a singing coach. Okay. And here's the deal. Whatever you're coaching someone in, it could be violin, presentation skills, uh, CrossFit games, athlete, shooting competitions, uh, whatever it is, there's the skill that you're helping them get better at. And then there's the story that they have running parallel to that. And I promise you part of that story is antithetical to them getting good and getting into the arena and competing and being seen and succeeding. It's called the victim mentality and being able to go in there and turn the volume down on that. It, it, it dramatically increases their ability to learn the skill that you're teaching them. Also known as the value that they're getting out of working with you. And a lot of times, a lot, a lot of times being able to provide that service, okay, going into these stuck stories and helping them get them, get them unstuck, it revitalizes people's coaching careers, their coaching practices. Because the, one of the most draining things in the world is to not be able to get results for your clients. That'll, that will just suck the life out of somebody's uh, a coaching practice and, and then, then, you know, self-doubt and the imposter syndrome creeps in. It's just, it's, it's natural for that to happen. Well, and then you take it to another level where like the results, like a, yes, on any level, someone's working with me, I want them to get results, but you also allow the coach to detach from the actual results, making sure they're moving along, but they're not attaching themselves to that outcome. And they're giving it back to their client, which I think is so important. It's, it's, uh, it's the opposite of energy draining. It's energy. It's, it's regenerative. Thank you. That's it's, the yeah, perfect word. Coaching, coaching like this, it's not sustainable. It's not. No. And it's that's better than that. It's, re- it's regenerative. Yes. In so many, I mean, again, I, I had plenty of experience in the CrossFit days years ago and I just saw coaches get burned out just for that simple fact that they just didn't know how to do it in a way that was, is regenerative. Yeah. I love it. And I'm, I'm curious one, one other thing before we wrap, you know, I kind of mentioned the, the NLP work before, like, what do you, what do you say to that and to people who, I mean, was my, again, I've never done it. Sure. It was just my assumption about it. Yep. Is that fairly accurate? Um, um, any, any conversation 
or um, organization or system that gets people thinking about their thinking more is very, very, very good. Okay. That's, that's my first answer. My second answer is in 2011, I got my NLP practitioner certification in London from Dr. Richard Bandler. It's five days. And in 2012, I went back and got my NLP master practitioner certification from Dr. Richard Bandler, who's one of the founders in London. And I'm here to say definitively that you cannot master something in 12 days. Boom. How can people work with you? I know you've mentioned a few things, but let's just tidy it up for them right here. If you want to get certified, come on in. Go to enlifted.me. And that's the website is all about that. What the prices are when the, the certifications start, how to book a discovery call. Um, once again, I deliver all the trainings. Um, and that's how you work with me. I don't work out. I don't, I don't do one-on-one coaching anymore. You get your Instagram. Yeah. At and lifted athletes. Excuse me. That's the, at and lifted coaches. At you have and lifted coaches. athletes as well. We, we did. Okay. Um, and that's, so we launched Procabulary, that standalone course, 21 days. We're retiring that brand. We shot a course with Mike Bledsoe for the fitness industry called the way of the enlifted athletes. And we thought we were going to sell online courses to the athletes. Um, and, and so we had that stuck in my head, whatever. And, um, yeah, the, the course is super fun. I'm in the course, Mike's in the course and, um, and his alter ego his his, his evil inner workout partner. Oh, no way. Billy is in the course. We dress him up in, in a, in a no. scarf and sunglasses yeah. and shirts like my wiener's huge in Japan. Yeah. And he's just throwing <laughs> out so yeah. hard. He's like, come on, you, you're never going to amount to anything. It's because for real, the, yeah. what's, what's the real pre-workout in the fitness industry? Oof. It's, it's not C4 explosive or rip fuel. It's the victim mentality. That's the real pre-workout. So true. I'm going to prove them all wrong. Yeah. I'll show them. They shouldn't have laughed at me in the fourth grade. Yeah. You go up and grab that bar and yeah, okay, great. And you're repping that story and, and like it, it, people walk out. My grandfather said, I was talking about this last night. He was a boatsmith. He, they, made, they made boats in the Chesapeake Bay. Famous. The Krentz Marina. They had a marina. Um, Krentz Marina Skipjacks. A skipjack is a shallow bottom boat for, um, or it's a flat bottom boat for shallow water oyster dredging. You had to have one. They were the best. And was, I mean, they just, just worked and worked and worked and built boats. And he said, if I ever see someone running and smiling, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I was like, that's genius. Because yeah. it's, it's not, it's not, it's not resting bitch face in the gym. It's active asshole face, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And then I, I was so like, my face was so rigid and tight after all those years of holding my breath and my fuel for my fight career was the victim mentality. I had a couple of memories when I was in elementary school of fights breaking out on the playground and I turned around and ran and I used that as proof that I was a coward. Yeah. And then, and then now I'm going to go fight and show them I'm not a coward. Show who, who thinks I'm a coward? No one, no one fucking has any, cares. Nobody's saying that. No, I'm hallucinating so things, these things in my head and pissing myself off and trapping my breath and then go roll around and hard contact everything. Of course, it's going to be snap city, but it's not my fault. It's that guy's fault that kicked me too hard. Yeah. Words, folks. Yes. Hell yeah. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. This has been Buddy, amazing. This has been fantastic. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen the Dalai Lama with the Mohawk. Oh yeah. My, yeah. my, a couple of like close friends gave that to me. They, they, they named it the Cali Lama. <laughs> right. Oh, and, and by the way, everybody, I have unlearned tattooed. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention that. My left, my right arm. From? 2005. Before I knew what the definition of unlearn is, the definition of unlearn is to undo the effect of. Mm. 
before I got into this work, anything. And now I'm sitting here with Cal Callahan on the Great Unlearn podcast. Spells are real, folks. The power of words real. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thanks for being here, brother. Pleasure.